Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, my team, uh, co-authors. Um, this is very much an interdisciplinary project. Um, we have agronomists, cropping systems people, soil scientists. We have mechanical engineers who work in thermal chemical um, systems. Uh, we have techno-economic analysis. We have e economists. So we are literally trying to work across the spectrum from molecular scales to global markets and uh, uh, indirect land use and, and related issues. So the motivation here, uh, what we're talking about is a system that is carbon negative and, and obviously IPC, IPCC fifth assessment report made it very clear uh, that if we want to avoid unacceptable levels of, of climate change, stay below two degrees C, we're going to have to go carbon negative, certainly to offset some anthropogenic emissions, which are very difficult to remove from, from our economy, uh, but also to over, because we're likely to overshoot and we're going to have to correct. So our technology, our system is a carbon negative system. It could be argued to be a form of Bex, or you could say it's an alternative to Bex, and it's really just a semantics uh, argument at that point. So what are we talking about? <clears throat> Uh, in this image is our sort of our grand vision. Uh, we have, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. So the landscape is covered with diverse sources of biomass, whether it's cropping systems, whether it's dedicated bioenergy crops, uh, such as uh, switchgrass or miscanthus grown on agronomically marginal lands, uh, highly erodible lands, or other lands that are, should not or ought not to be uh, farmed. Uh, we could have dedicated uh, you know, a tree forest crops. Uh, all of this biomass can be um, pyrolyzed, uh, thermochemically transformed into renewable energy products, and I'll talk more about that later. And a co-product, which we call biochar, which is basically condensed aromatic carbon that is uh, uh, the, the solid residue of the thermal chemical processing. The vision is to use the char as a soil amendment. And the value here comes in the fact that the right char and the right soil can enhance soil quality. It can actually enhance uh, uh, plant growth, uh, primary productivity, uh, cropping, uh, crop yields, and so on. It also has some impacts in terms of enhancing um, nutrient water use efficiency in cropping systems, and in potentially in reducing nutrient loss to uh, rivers, groundwater. Uh, at the same time, this becomes carbon negative because the half-life of char carbon is measured in the hundreds, if not thousands of years, depending on char quality. And um, <clears throat> whereas the half-life of plant biomass, uh, such as a leaf or corn stover, uh, is measured in months. And so by the thermochemical transformation of that material into a, a highly recalcitrant form, we we're actually able to achieve uh, carbon negative uh, systems. <clears throat> Our GSEP project uh, is centered around a vertically integrated uh, uh, modeling approach. So at the very center of this, uh, we have a model, which is the APSIM biochar model. And APSIM is a broader uh, internationally used cropping systems model. And what we've done is to introduce a char model here. Now, the reason we're doing this is that there's not one type of char, but there's a really a, a huge diversity, an infinite diversity of char types. We also have an infinite, almost infinite diversity of soil types. We've got huge variability in cropping systems, in climates, in management, 
And so we've got an N by N by N by N by N diversity system that we're dealing with. And it turns out that obviously it, you don't get the right type of char and the right system in the right way, you can see a negative uh, response. On the other hand, if you have the right type in the right place in the right way, you can see a positive response. And before we're going to be able to scale this up to a level to have an impact on climate systems, we have to have an understanding at a both a basic level and at an application level of this system. And, and our approach to that then is through the modeling effort. We also uh, have the uh, techno-economic analysis of pyrolysis systems. We have economists looking at markets, indirect land use issues, and a diverse other systems. So just briefly, APSM, as I said, is a cropping system model. It's very widely used, uh, over 3,000 uh, users worldwide, uh, and its use is growing very rapidly. It's originally developed by CSIRO out of Australia. Um, it functions at a soil pedon level. So you, soil is essentially divided up into a sequence of layers in which we're uh, controlling the, or quantifying the mass and energy balance of the system, uh, growing a crop on that system, watching the roots grow in silico. Uh, inputs, obviously, are a daily climate time step. Uh, so rainfall, solar radiation, um, as well as uh, you know, runoff, run on, uh, leaching of nutrients, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you can run this with any historic climate database or with any synthetic future database. Although it works at a pedon scale, it can be readily scaled up to landscape or even global scale. So what we've done, and, and through APSM support here, is to add into um, the uh, APSM model, um, a biochar module, which allows us to input the type of char that we're dealing with, a series of physical chemical properties of those chars. And this feeds, propagates through the entire um, APSM model. Uh, and this is a very simplified diagram. The upper uh, left box basically represents uh, what happens to fresh biomass as it is biochemically transformed into humified uh, organic matter or CO2, which is emitted out to the atmosphere. The lower left box is the nitrogen cycle, so looking at nitrogen mineralization and mobilization, uh, nitrification, um, denitrification processes. In the upper right is a water box, a water mass balance box, so we're looking at the um, uh, inputs, obviously, but also uh, hydraulic uh, properties of the soil, its drainage upper limit, its drainage lower limit, uh, change in reservoir uh, properties. And the lower right-hand box is the plant phenology, so it controls what type of, how that plant grows in the system. And APSM currently, by the way, handles over 30 different crops, and new crops are being added all, uh, on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> What we've done is everything in red has now been modified. And this was uh, um, uh, published earlier this year and is currently being vetted by the APSIM, APSIM um, Oversight Committee. And uh, if it passes vetting, and I'm, I'm quite confident it will since one of the directors is a co-author on that paper, um, we will be uh, uh, in the next public release of APSIM. Um, this is, uh, uh, as I said, it's, a, it's a, actually a public domain, free access model, um, and so it will be made wide, worldwide. So in addition to doing the math, we also have to validate, calibrate this system. And so we have a number of different uh, agronomic uh, field trials underway. This is just one example uh, in which we're comparing a number of potential uh, biomass crops, a switchgrass, a high diversity polyculture, a low diversity uh, grass uh, prairie system, and then obviously continuous corn with maize uh, uh, stover harvesting. Another example of our field trial, this is a much, uh, almost 216 different plots in this system. 
um, involves a series of different crop rotations that integrate switchgrass into the system. But because we have an n-dimensional problem, we've got all these different types of soils and chars and climates and so on, we also have to do a lot of work in, at a greenhouse soil microcosm scale, and this allows us to look at the interactions that occur, uh, you know, bring in a lot more different interactions at the system, and it also allows us to control the system much uh, better. So how's, this, how's the model working at this point? Um, this is some, some data from uh, actual field trial work. The line represents model predictions. So in the upper uh, left-hand corner, we have the estimate of soil organic matter, and it looks like in this case we might be overshooting it just a little bit, but that could easily be a consequence of not knowing the depth of incorporation of the char precisely in that system. So a bulk density, we're right on the money with that uh, in terms of being able to predict it. Uh, soil pH uh, looks pretty good. Soil water content, also uh, we're doing very well. In terms of grain yield, uh, that's a little more complicated. Um, cropping systems are incredibly complicated systems. Uh, and for example, the APSOM model, as good as it is, doesn't account for things like insect predation, uh, doesn't account for management errors and other things that go on. Uh, so we're not yet fully able to um, predict at, on an individual field basis, but we believe we're pretty good on a statewide or you know, a larger area when you integrate across the system. Um, Here's a second test of it, and this was uh, data from, published data from Julie Major down in Columbia. And in this case, we actually did a pretty good job of, of uh, predicting yield response to char applications down in these highly weathered soils in the tropics. Uh, in this example, uh, this is out at one of our field trials, we have um, soil moisture sensors uh, buried in the ground, and we're monitoring uh, soil moisture content every 30 minutes uh, at four depths in these soils. And this happens to be for the maize system. The upper layer shows you the control in which there is no char, and the red line shows you the model prediction uh, for this uh, system. The lower system shows the uh, char amended site, which is there, these are four reps of each of these. And the first thing to notice is that in the char system, we're able to retain substantially more water in this soil. And uh, this is so because of the um, increased infiltration and increased retention that the char is adding to the system. Uh, we're also able to predict that fairly well with the APSOM model. Uh, we do see a few problems uh, in a couple places, uh, and uh, some of that may be the quality of the uh, climate data that we're comparing this against, that is the rainfall input. Okay, so switching now to the contribution of the engineering team, which is led by Robert Brown, who's one of the world's leading experts in fast pyrolysis technology. And this is just a schematic of the fast pyrolysis uh, unit that uh, Robert and his team have developed. And in this, you'll notice that the, this is a fluidized bed uh, uh, pyrolyzer. The char is separated out with a couple of cyclones. And then the key points here are that the volatiles are staged, they use a stage fraction approach to condense out uh, a heavy end, a light end, and then, of course, the non-condensable gases. So if we look at the products that come out of the fast pyrolyzer, here's the char, um, and um, here is a fraction. The heavy ends, simply by a water separation, this water-soluble versus insoluble, you're able to isolate a sugar fraction, which is dominantly liboglucosin and is readily fermentable. It needs to be cleaned up a little bit, uh, but that is, technology has been developed. Um, uh, on the other side, uh, the phenolic oil fraction, it's uh, 
essentially a bio crude. If you, if you hydrogenate it, you can send it off to a, um, any existing oil refinery and turn it into diesel or jet or other fuels. Um, you can also turn it into uh, higher value products like carbon fibers. Uh, we paved part of a um, bike path in Des Moines, Iowa with uh, the bio oil, with this phenolic oil fraction. Um, but intriguingly, one of the, of course, one of the biggest challenges we have is scaling up. If we could send a, a unit train load of this material to a refinery every week, they'd be happy to take it. If we try to send them one, one truckload a month, uh, they're going to laugh at us. So how do we scale up? And one of the key innovations that has occurred uh, in the near future, in the recent past, is the development of a product that we're calling lignocole. Basically, all you have to do is heat this stuff up a little bit to about 140 degrees, and it auto-polymerizes into a, a brick, which has same energy density of coal, can be crushed and handled same as coal, and can be burnt in any proportion with a coal-fired, uh, with coal in any existing boiler. So here's the unit that uh, uh, Robert is operating right now at a quarter ton a day. Um, and you see this phenolic oil is about 21% of the mass. The sugars are about uh, 8%, and uh, the uh, basically acetic acid and other like light oxygenates are, are uh, the balance of this material. Uh, Mark Wright, uh, who's been doing some techno-economic analysis, looking at the opportunities of this system and where it fits in, has compared two scenarios uh, in this system. He's looking, obviously, at a char and a biofuel scenario. And in the lower system, essentially all of the products are being combusted using running through a steam a turbine system to generate electricity. So the products are char and electricity. And at this point in time, his, his analysis is suggesting, and OK, the way to read this, this would be the biochar price. And this is the unit price of electricity um, in green, and the unit price of the liquid fuel products in dollars per gallon. So essentially, at, at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, the char would be essentially free. And for the um, uh, 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 liquid fuel program or process at, at about $3 a gallon, uh, then no value would have to come from the char. And if the price obviously goes down, uh, then, uh, then the value of the char has to go up to reach a, this is all set for a 10% um, internal rate of return. And this considers no uh, external credit, carbon credit, or s government subsidy. So it's close to being economically viable. Obviously, the cost of fossil fuels is a huge factor in determining the competitiveness of this technology. Now, Dermot Hayes and the economists have been trying to look at more of a macro scale. They uh, are use a, the FAPRI model, which is uh, a major a primary model used uh, for setting agricultural policy. Uh, and they've interfaced this with uh, Green Ag Sim, which is the model that is used by the Environmental Protection Agency in uh, setting renewable fuel standards, in, in um, assessing indirect land use effects. And so uh, Dermot is, is working, trying to say, well, you know, what if, how's the impact of a pyrolysis bioener biochar bioenergy system going to be on global markets on, on indirect land use. And this is just a, an example of uh, some of the prior work that uh, Dermot did in this area. In this system, he considered what would happen if you had a one acre of, of, of grain, of land that you converted from food production, say corn grain, to corn ethanol. And uh, obviously, the primary factor that is impacting the net emissions of CO2 from that is the indirect land use effect. However, he said, well, what if we also um, harvested the stover and used that for um, bioenergy through the pyrolysis biochar platform? 
And it turns out that one of the really key things here is the net impact of the char on agricultural productivity. And if you can increase that productivity by 6%, then suddenly you have an inverse indirect land use effect. It can turn this entire thing into carbon negative. And this means that the, the, the power of increasing yields, increasing intensification of agricultural production can suddenly turn this thing um, around into a carbon negative system. It can turn grain ethanol into a carbon negative system. And finally, I want to just end uh, by mentioning some of the work that's ongoing. Uh, we've built a collaboration with Easy Energy Systems and uh, Stein Seed Company uh, to commercialize this technology. Uh, as we speak, we're building a 50 ton a day uh, pilot scale system, which hopefully by this time next year will be up and running. And uh, the primary uh, energy product out of this will be the Lignicol, which will be uh, um, uh, actually co-fired with, with coal in the ISU power plant. And uh, biobutanol will be the uh, fermentation product coming out of it. And then, of course, the biochar, which will be tested on agricultural soils. And so finally, I, I want to thank uh, GSEP for funding that has supported this uh, work. And I also want to acknowledge all the graduate students, postdocs, technicians, and many other people who have been involved uh, in this overall uh, very broad team. So with that, I thank you. <laughs>Okay, I'll start with a question. A lot of um, national and subnational governments are currently considering the potential role of soil carbon towards their, for example, 2030 goals, and there's been a fair amount of agonizing over the uncertainties. So if you were to say, here's how to think about possibilities for biochar in the real world over the next decade, how do you see the risks and opportunities? Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and the French have taken the lead on this, uh, and so I want to applaud their effort in that regard. Um, the uncertainty is a huge problem, and this is, of course, why we are working on a, at a modeling system. Uh, I can measure very accurately how many tons of char I put on the ground. That's easy. But there are, is, is a potential priming effect. Does the char accelerate mineralization of soil organic matter? Does the char accelerate the formation of new humic substances from biomass? And it works in both directions. And we think, on average, it's increasing it. Uh, secondly, this indirect land use effect is huge. If we can quantify that impact, uh, then it, you know, it's not just the tons of char carbon we put down. It's all these other ramifications through the economic and agroecosystem that are important. And we're never going to be able to predict accurately for any one field. But we think we can get the, uh, the model to predict at a regional level what the average is. And obviously, any kind of policy uh, will discount relative to a regional average, not on a specific field basis. Clint Chapel, Purdue. Um, when we think about a biorefinery, we always have to be mindful about the transportation costs of the feedstock to the biorefinery. And so I was interested that your model now incorporates a new transportation component back to the field. And so even if the bio, even if the biochar is free, do you have a sense for what those, you must have a sense for what those costs will be, how much farmers will pay for it, how, it given various um, benefits that they would derive, plus the cost, of course, for them to distribute that over across the field? Uh, yeah, transportation, logistics, storage handling are huge issues uh, with, with biomass harvesting. I live seven miles from uh, DuPont's uh, cellulosic ethanol plant, and over the last um, four years as they've been ramping up for this, they've had, I think, at least four uh, biomass fires. Uh, it, it just seems like you put that much biomass in one place, it's going to burn. Uh, and also, it's a very low density material, so transporting it to a centralized location um, is hugely problematic. The original DOE vision of 1,000 ton, ton a day 
uh, biorefineries, uh, quite frankly, in, in my judgment, will never work just because of the transportation, storage, logistics, handling issues associated with any biomass harvesting uh, storage and transport system. Um, yes, uh, we do have a, a reverse transport of the char, but you're also adding value to the soil quality, and the farmer is reaping some uh, benefit of that. Um, in fact, in, in long-term continuous corn on high-quality soils in Iowa, uh, we've recorded about a, a 13 bushel per acre yield increase, and that is not, sig not insignificant. So there is value there for the farmer uh, to purchase and transport that from the uh, plant gate. Um, we don't envision huge refineries. We're thinking of a much more distributed system, uh, perhaps topping out at maybe 200 ton a day type of, of plant. Uh, and we think that that is a really critical piece in mitigating some of the problems of um, transportation storage, uh, allowing for on-farm and relatively short transport distances, both to the plant and then of char coming back. Uh, um, I have uh, acreage in the Central Valley, and I'm wondering uh, when I might be able to apply this material, biochar, on my soil. Uh, how much would it cost per uh, acre or, or what hectare for, and how much would I apply? And um, we're in the drought side of yeah, the yeah. valley, yeah, down, yeah. down in the southern half of the valley. All right, so, so there is a, a, an emerging biochar industry in the U.S. and around the world. There's about 300 entrepreneurs uh, who you can buy biochar from in the U.S. at this time. Uh, however, they are mostly backyard garage scale operations. Um, and they are overwhelmingly targeting niche markets. So they're looking at uh, horticulture high value niche markets, horticulture, land remediation, mine lands, urban brown fields, um, and very high value crops. So perhaps something like strawberries in the Central Valley where the, the, the cost is what, over $50,000 an acre to bring in those strawberries. If you can increase water use efficiency by 10% uh, or so, uh, that would be really valuable uh, and be, be willing to uh, uh, you could afford to put the char on. Uh, for Iowa corn farmers who have very thin margins, uh, the economics aren't there at this time. Uh, for that to happen, this whole industry has to scale up dramatically uh, so that the supply is high and the cost starts coming down. You can purchase char today anywhere from $200 to $1,000 a ton. Um, we need to see those prices coming down to maybe under $100 a ton before it will be economically viable for broad-scale production agriculture. It is already uh, viable for these niche markets. So uh, how big are your margins? <laughs> how, how, many, how much per? Right, okay, that, we've run trials on that and, and most the, the optimum seems to be between 10 and 20 tons per acre from an agronomic perspective. Okay, thank you very much. Why don't we give one more round of applause and I'll turn it over to Richard for posters. Thank you.